And what we calculate, so this is a molybdenum loading, which we control. So we're keeping the silico aluminum ratio constant. So in effect, the most important parameter that has been rarely reported is the number of aluminum sites, of the anchoring sites, that are available in the zeolite to support the molybdenum. So initially, we have our structure on two aluminum atoms with the Raman band at 993. Then when we start increasing the molybdenum concentration, as we're running out, out of those special aluminum sites where two of them are close by, so these are the preferred sites. They occupy it first. And then we start populating the sites with single aluminum atoms. Uh, these two Raman bands cannot be from the same species because the ratio of these bands change as we change the uh, uh, molecular concentration. So we do have the confirmation that we have two different, uh, distinctly different molecular species. So if this is true, and we've identified the right structures, and we have the right explanation for the dependence of the molybdenum structures on the molybdenum loading, it should also hold true if we reverse the experiment. In the reverse experiment, we keep the molybdenum concentration constant, so the molybdenum concentration stays at 2 weight percent, and then we use different zeolites. So we're varying the silico aluminum ratio. So the silico aluminum ratio changes, and the number of aluminum sites available for each molybdenum also changes. So initially, we see the same species. So molybdenum on uh, double aluminum sites, on those special sites that are close by. But then, if we decrease the aluminum concentration, then, as you imagine in the zeolite, so if the concentration of aluminum drops, then the aluminum atoms are further apart and the number of those special sites decreases not linearly, but dramatically if we decrease the concentration, the overall concentration of aluminum. So we lose the species almost immediately if we drop the concentration of aluminum and go from silicon aluminum 15 to 25. We don't observe the uh, um, species on the uh, double aluminum sites. We observe only the species with single aluminum sites. Then, if we continue increasing the silica aluminum ratio, so the aluminum concentration decreases, with the highest silica aluminum ratio of 140, <coughs> there's very few aluminum atoms, and essentially we run out of aluminum sites. So the aluminum to molybdenum ratio is less than one. So what happens then? We have an additional band that has to be molybdenum going on silica. So if we run out of aluminum, it has to be on silica. So the structure that we proposed is molybdenum with two terminal atoms, so molybdenum dioxo anchored on silica sites. Uh, we did additional calculation, we matched the frequency, and what we found from the calculations that we cannot stabilize those species in the pores of the zeolite. Uh, because we don't have the hydroxyls on silica unless we break the zeolite structure. But on the external surface of silica, we have plenty of hydroxyls. So those species must be on the external surface of the um, zeolite. So these are our three structures that we have identified. So one is um, molybdenum dioxo with two terminal atoms on two aluminum sites. The next one is on single aluminum sites with two terminal oxygen atoms and an extra hydroxyl group to keep the uh, chromium in the plus six oxidation state. And then the final one is on the external silica sites, a similar structure with two terminal oxygen atoms and two atoms that connected to the zeolite framework. We have direct evidence observation of the anchoring sites. If we do the IR measurements, we can see those OH groups before we put the molybdenum um, on the catalyst. So this is the spectrum um, at the bottom. As we put the 
uh, molybdenum, we can see the decrease in the IR peaks for those hydroxyl groups. The OH groups on the aluminum sides, they're all the same, because initially we just have hydrogen. So we do not discriminate with IR between uh, double aluminum and single aluminum, because it's still hydrogen is the same on all of them. So when we put the molybdenum, this peak decreases dramatically. The second is silica sites on the external <laughs> surface. They are reduced at higher molybdenum loadings. And we have a third one, which is a minority species. Uh, we do see extra framework aluminum, and they're slightly perturbed. So this also serves as um, additional anchoring sites, although it's hard to see them in the spectrum. <coughs> we did an additional study on chromium oxide, and um, Israel Wax is going to talk more about the structure of uh, chromium and other metals on ZSM5. Um, this is an important uh, comparison because first time when we started submitting our manuscripts on the structure of molybdenum oxides, the first question that we had from the reviewers was how confident are we about the structure of molybdenum species that we've identified. They were concerned that all the previous lecture, um, all the previous literature was claiming something else uh, for the most part. So if you remember, I mentioned that the salt that we're using has seven molybdenum atoms um, in it. So there's a lot of literature that just claims that probably it just structures with seven molybdenum atoms, or perhaps with some polymer chains, or <laughs> it's some other type of a molybdenum structure with uh, dimers or with something else. So the biggest concern from the reviewers was our confidence in the identification of the structures that we have. For me, the most convincing argument is actually the comparison with chromium. So the study was with the same methodology. We use multiple spectroscopic methods and, in addition, DFT calculation to identify the chromium structures. The chromium structures are exactly the same as molybdenum structures. So we have, on double aluminum sites, we have the chromium with two terminal oxygen atoms. The Raman bands are 964. If it's sitting on the silica sites, it's at 984. The importance of chromium is that this system has actually been very extensively studied. So if we look at chromium on silica, the Raman band is at 982. And this structure has not just been reported, it being studied inside and out because this is a Phillips, um, uh, this is a Phillips polymerization catalyst from Minnesota. So there's dozens, if not hundreds, of papers. Um, I just referenced a couple of reviews. One of them is actually from uh, Baird in Israel more than 20 years ago. Uh, this is a structure from this direct uh, this uh, review. Um, and uh, there in Israel reported it a long time ago, and it has been uh, confirmed by so many different studies with so many different techniques that we have full confidence that that is the right structure. So if you look at this structure, this is exactly the same structure. So if we have the uh, monomeric uh, chromate ions on silica, we believe that we identify exactly the same structures on the external surface of CSM5, then it gives us so much more confidence that we've got the right structures for the molybdenum on the framework aluminum sites as well. So now what happens to those molybdenum um, oxide species under reaction conditions? In this experiment, we were raising the temperature, collecting the Raman spectra as a function of time, so it's a function of temperature as well. And then we were monitoring the products that we are producing um, during that reaction. So this is the definition of operando, collecting um, spectroscopic results as you are monitoring the uh, uh, production of uh, the consumption of the feed and the uh, production of products. 
So initially, we have the run bands on 975 and 993, so for single and double lumen sites. When we introduce methane, these peaks disappear. So here's what happens. Initially, our only product is CO2. We're not making any other carbon-containing products. It's just CO2. Since we don't have the oxygen in our system, the only oxygen has to come from the molybdenum species. So that means we are reducing our molybdenum oxide and converting them to carbide form. Then the CO production is stops. It stops abruptly, and we start producing additional things. Once we have the, our molybdenum carbide, then we're making C2 species, and we start making benzene. Then, at a higher, as we continue running the reaction with increasing the reaction time and at higher temperatures, we deposit a lot of coal on the catalyst, and the catalyst deactivates rapidly. So from this experiment, and that has been confirmed with previous studies with um, Axaf and Zane, that the working structure of the catalyst is not the oxide. It converts to um, carbide particles. So the composition changes. And from the atomically dispersed molybdenum, it actually forms larger carbide particles. But if we regenerate the catalyst with oxygen, so this is our fresh catalyst, and the majority of species, 993 is a, on double lumen size for this molybdenum uh, for this uh, molybdenum <coughs> concentration at silica lumen 15. So during the reaction, no bands, our oxide is gone. But if we treat it with oxygen, really a remarkable thing happens. We do two things. First, we put it back in the oxide form. So this is not surprising, right? So we can oxidize it back. The surprising thing is that we redisperse it. We put it back into the atomic form where it's completely dispersed on the surface of ZSM5. And amazingly, it binds pretty much the same anchoring size. So as if we're putting the molybdenum um, as a fresh catalyst, it, the uh, size of the peak and the uh, uh, position of the peak is almost exactly the same as for the fresh catalyst. If we look closely at what is happening during the regeneration, so this are the Raman spectra looking closely at what happens during the regeneration time. So we are in oxygen regenerating the catalyst. Initially, we are converting the molybdenum carbide particles into an oxide form, and we put them on the uh, structure with two aluminum anchoring sites. They are populated first. Then, as we're increasing the regeneration time, we populate the sites with single aluminum atoms. This is the second round of band. And then if we increase the regeneration time, we start populating the sites on the external surface where silica atoms serve as anchoring sites. So this is exactly the same population preference that we saw when we put the initial molybdenum as a function of the molybdenum loading for the fresh catalyst. So if we continue, the trend continues, and more and more of the uh, um, molybdenum species, we force them to be on the external sites, on silica external sites. So we are regenerating them sequentially with exactly the same sequence as the deposition uh, of molybdenum for the fresh catalyst. Now for the activity. So what we did, we took the catalyst, at different stages of regeneration. So first we deactivated it for exactly the same period of time, for 80 minutes. Then we regenerated them for different periods of time to match the um, Raman experiment. And then we measured the activity. So here's what we see. This is the activity of a fresh catalyst. 
So initially, the activity goes through the roof, and we actually will show that. So after about 20 to 30 minutes, then it kind of stabilizes, and then it declines, um, and then it becomes really low and stable. Um, if we regenerate for two hours, and we have all our molybdenum species initially, the double aluminum, single aluminum, and the silica sites on the external surface, we match the performance